This is the PlayStation VR. It is a consumer version of it, so it's not been sent out by Sony or anybody like that. It is a purchased version. It's the version that comes with Horizon Call of the Wild, so that I've got a big first party game to play with it, which costs 500 and 69 pounds. That's a lot of money. The aim of this video today is to unbox it, set it up, see what that process is like, get some game time, and see if it's a worthwhile investment for the majority of gamers out there, or even the more niche gamers out there. So, without any further ado, shall we get into the box here? Unboxing is a fairly simple affair. When you open the retail packaging, there is a white box inside that you need to extract. Once done, it is a one-handed opening for the main box. It contains another small box of accessories, the headset, and a pair of sense controllers, one for each hand. And that's everything. It also comes with an instruction booklet that is worth reading before proceeding with the setup. The setup itself is fairly simple as long as you follow the instructions. First, plug the headset into the PS5's front-facing USB-C port. You'll turn the console on via its power button, then the PSVR2 headset via its own power button on the underside of the visor. At this point, the console set up as it appears on your TV screen, as you are seeing here. Simply follow its instructions step by step to complete the setup. It will guide you through connecting the stereo headset by pushing it into the 3.5mm headphone jack and an anchor point on the other side, pairing the sense controllers by plugging each one in and then turning them on, and then getting the headset on and adjusting it appropriately. Once done, you're ready to play. My first impression of the VR2 was not what I expected as I was simply navigating around the PS5 home screen. But this theatre mode, as it is known, is a fantastic addition to the VR headset. In essence, you are greeted with a giant screen of your console in an otherwise pitch black room. And this is a HDMI 2.1 display. So all of the mod cons that a 2.1 display offers are available here. This does mean that the first game I played on my VR headset was God of War Ragnarok at 120 frames per second. And honestly, I have zero regrets. It's my first experience of a HDMI 2.1 screen for gaming, as well as PlayStation's VR offering, and I was very nicely shocked. But HDMI 2.1 has been covered to death in this generation thus far, so I'll touch on it a bit more later. But first, I want to look at the VR itself. The first thing I noticed loading into a VR experience, which was Horizon Call of the Mountain, was the lack of a screen door effect. A sort of hatch pattern in front of the lenses that is present in many other VR headsets. Now granted, I've only used one other VR headset, the HTC Vive 2 Pro, but from feedback I've received about other headsets, they all have a similar effect. Now it's still there on the VR too, but it is much less noticeable, which really heightens the immersion. The second thing that I noticed was that I had terrible motion sickness. So I've had to build myself up to longer sessions in games after nearly falling over on my first try within 10 minutes. The motion sickness was there in most titles for me, from Gran Turismo 7 to Star Wars to Humankind and Horizon, on different scales granted, and it is lessening with each use of the headset. It got a lot better when I started wearing the headset correctly, which oddly isn't outlined to you during the initial setup process. As it turns out, the band at the back should sit underneath the back of your skull almost where it meets the spine. This then puts the viewfinder in the correct position in front of your eyes to eliminate blurriness, which helps drastically with motion sickness. There is also the fact that apparently it can be like sea legs with VR, and it just takes a bit of time to acclimatize to the new experience. Once I overcame my extreme nausea, Call of the Mountain as my first experience absolutely blew me away. The background footage here is what did it for me, and this is just the first few minutes of the game. The scale of the robo-dinos, the beauty of the water, the sheer scale of this world that I've navigated twice previously as Aloy, suddenly hit home. To then be directly interacting with that world, with what felt like my own hands, was an unreal step up. Gameplay is solid too, if a little odd on occasion, like running with your hands, but it kind of works. The climbing is intuitive, and if you're standing when playing, full body movement is completely intuitive, as you would expect. And while other games don't have the jaw-dropping fidelity of Call of the Mountain, they are all good in their own rights. 
Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge is a more traditional VR first-person shooter experience, and I really do like it, despite not being a huge Star Wars fan. The gunplay is good, the teleport movement mechanics are much easier on an unstable equilibrium, and even though it is a lesser graphically impressive title, it still looks really good. Especially vistas like this. Gran Turismo 7, though. Well, if you want to see truly stunning and amazing visuals, this is the game for you. It looks and feels nearly real. Which, considering this picture was my last VR driving experience, an F1 car from 2016 and a rig with all of the wheel, pedal, chair and fan feedback, is high praise indeed, especially when I'm also using a controller now. The games all live and die on their own merits, but I will say that despite a library that only spreads around 40 games at the time of writing, there are top quality experiences for all sorts of gamers, and many more on the horizon, including a western roguelike and supernatural shooter that I'm very interested in. But as just a piece of hardware, PSVR 2 has big pros and big cons. Let's start with those pros. This is an incredibly easy headset to set up and get started with. It is near enough plug and play, whereas you compare that to say the MetaQuest 2, which a lot of comparisons are being made with, the setup is much lengthier, requires additional accounts that now want government provided ID to set up or regain, and is then sluggish doing all of the computing on the headset itself on a three year old chipset. PlayStation VR 2 is also light when on your head, meaning extended gaming sessions are much more manageable. As PSVR 2 uses the PlayStation 5 hardware to run the games, there is a much higher ceiling of possibility and fidelity, which a few titles are already taking advantage of, especially those VR patches on existing console experiences. The resolution is stunning and really heightens immersion, even in the more cartoony games. It feels better simply by looking better. The single cable setup is easier than nearly any other wired headset, and a huge step up from the original PSVR. The Sense controllers are ergonomic, comfortable and intuitive, using cameras on the PSVR 2 headset to operate rather than the Move controllers and static camera of old. The rubber mask is a far better choice than the foam you find on many other headsets. It offers better light blocking, is far more flexible and comfortable and doesn't leave bits of itself behind on your face. It also gives enough space and flexibility for glasses to be easily worn with the headset. The attached cable is over 4 meters long, meaning you should realistically never pull your PlayStation out of place and still have slack to move around with. And the function button that lets you see through the headset without taking it off is amazing. Then, as mentioned earlier, it also offers a HDMI 2.1 experience as an additional bonus in theater mode, which all non-VR content is automatically displayed in. For many gamers, this is a big step up over their 1080p or 4K60 TV sets, and is far cheaper than a 4K HDMI 2.1 TV. On the front of price, at £539 for the headset and controllers, PlayStation VR 2 is still far cheaper than any other comparably spec headsets such as that aforementioned HTC Vive 2 Pro. Hey guys, future editing Doragon here. I just wanted to pop in and give a bit of an update on a couple of other positives that I've noticed whilst still playing on the VR while editing this review together. The first one is the haptics in the headset itself. I didn't think they bore mentioning because the haptics in the DualSense controller were so good and these would just be transferable, but they really are game changing. The fact that I can feel getting shot from behind and whip around to take the appropriate action is a big thing in an already immersive full world where wherever I turn my head is the game world to then have the feeling of that game world anywhere on my face which is much more sensitive than my hands for example is phenomenal and I really like that implementation with this headset. The other one is on the headset itself there is a microphone an actually really quite good microphone which will pick up your voice, or if, like me, you had a cold whilst making most of this video, all of your laboured breathing. That means for like on-device content creators, live streaming directly through the PlayStation 5 and the VR headset, they don't need any additional equipment to live stream and have their voice included within it, because there is a good quality mic already in the headset. Just a couple of little other things that I wanted to add into this review that I've noticed since initially writing the script. 
But it's not all sunshine and roses in PlayStation Town. The headset is made entirely of plastic. Thin, pliable, and possibly very breakable plastic. At £539 for the headset alone, this sort of lower build quality feeling isn't really acceptable. Couple that with the fact that this is a wired headset at that price, when multiple others are completely wireless for £150 less, the questions over value for money start to make a lot more sense. The next point I'm bringing up because many others have. I personally, however, do not think it is a negative. And that's the 40 games at launch for the hardware. Bear in mind I was there at the 6 game PlayStation 2 launch, so this is joyous in comparison. The lack of backwards compatibility for PSVR games though. Well that I do have issues with. I realise that the way the two headsets work is drastically different. But there are fun and amazing experiences locked on hardware that can only be bought second hand now. There are players who knew the second device was coming, so stocked up on existing PSVR games to play on the new headset that are now worthless to them due to the lack of compatibility. I wish Sony had learned a lesson from the backlash to the attempted closure of the Vita and PS3 stores and ensured that there were ways to play these games on the new headset. The biggest negative of the PlayStation VR 2 though is the unknown. The fact that I know more experiences are coming, experiences that I want to have, is reassuring. Games like Foglands and Synapse seem like enough to keep me interested for a while. And there is Firewall Ultra, a first-party first-person shooter built in Unreal Engine 5, coming within the launch window. And updates of games like Beat Saber and Astrobot Rescue Mission to work with the new headset. But these aren't system sellers. These aren't The Last of Us or God of War for the PlayStation 5 system. They're more akin to Stray and Destiny. Great experiences and amazing fun, but not the reason you buy into a whole new gaming platform. The PSVR 2 is in an awkward spot because of trust. The PlayStation 4 and 5 have been amazingly well supported with software and services over the course of their lifetimes. The original PSVR had 672 games and experiences released for it since its launch in October 2016. But then, there are aspects like the PlayStation 3 that have been under-supported with backwards compatibility since the PlayStation 4 launch, and the PS Vita the follow-up handheld device to the amazing PlayStation Portable, which did a very similar thing to the PlayStation VR 2. Has all the bells, has all the whistles, is still a stunning handset in 2023 that had Uncharted and Assassin's Creed on it at launch at the height of both series, but nothing thereafter. PlayStation have a sketchy history of supporting new hardware. Sometimes it's amazing and it promotes the use and growth of the hardware, like the PSP and sometimes they release something and then forget about it, or leave it to fend for itself, like the PS Vita. This little handheld here is the core of my concerns with PlayStation VR 2. I bought this PlayStation Vita on launch day back in 2011, and immediately fell in love with it. My PlayStation 3 was abandoned by me for 3 or 4 months, and support was outlined to last through the PS4's lifespan as well. But the longer I waited, the more I wanted to play the little PS4 in my pocket, the less support it got from its parent company. It was a vicious cycle. The console cost as much as a PlayStation 4, which made it harder to buy into, meaning less initial players. Less players meant less studios wanting to develop for it. Less studios developing meant less killer games and software for the device, which meant less players. And the cycle begins anew. My initial PlayStation VR 2 experience has been stunning, just as with the Vita. I love the games, the inputs, and the immersion that are there currently. But I cannot deny that the price is high. Higher than even the console it connects to. I've been looking for holidays recently, and that £569 can get a 10-night fully inclusive holiday to southern Italy. While I know there are experiences on the horizon that I want to have with PSVR 2, beyond them, it's an unknown landscape that gives me PlayStation Vita vibes again. And I really need a getaway holiday this year. But here's my situation. I'm loving my time with the PlayStation VR 2. Even if it does go the way of the Vita, I felt I got my money's worth out of that little console in its lifetime. I already find myself longing to jump back into the PlayStation VR worlds when I'm doing nearly anything else. And with how easy it is to set up every time, there's none of that feeling of, I can't be bothered. It's plug and play. Minus moving the coffee table on occasion. 
I use it for non-VR gaming to get the additional HDMI 2.1 benefits, or to game while someone else uses the TV for anything else, be it another console, gaming service, or video option. I'm happy with my experience so far, and I'm happy with what is on the horizon. I'm not so naive, though, to say that everyone should rush out and buy a PSVR 2. This isn't a must-buy for the majority of gamers right now. But it might well be a must-buy in short time, especially if the software support remains strong or even grows. PSVR 2, despite its expense, is the most accessible VR experience. While costing £1,039 to set up from scratch, that's still cheaper than the HTC Vive 2 Pro standalone headset at £1,299, which PSVR 2 and a PS5 is closest to technically, and it uses an interface that most home console gamers are already used to. For those standalone headsets, most users will advise you to connect to a PC for a better experience anyway, and I don't have a spare 3 grand to pick up an entry level 40 series PC to then spend another 1200 on a headset thereafter. So like I said, PlayStation Virtual Reality 2 is the most accessible VR experience going. And yes, I do include the Quest 2 in that, despite its cheaper price point, given the recommendation for a PC as well. There are legitimate concerns that I have with it moving forward, born from PlayStation's speckled support history. But I'm going to be keeping my headset, because I enjoy my time with it. I have no other VR options open to me, other than the VR arcade that I live near, and that's £50 for four hours every time, plus a bit of travel. And my situation is going to be the same as many other adopters of PlayStation VR 2, whether they adopt early or further down the line. So I'm going to go jump back into Horizon Call of the Mountain, and then have a race in Gran Turismo 7. In the meantime, you can check out this other video about an Amazon product and their sketchy support of that. And until next time, guys, thank you for tuning in. Have yourselves a fantastic day and take care.